you realize that it doesn't matter if it's Japan mm -hmm. or Sweden or mm -hmm. Canada or there are a set of fundamental questions that you need to ask yourself uh, if you are going to be successful in sort of figuring out how to launch something, how to grow something, how to establish something, um, which goes you know, beyond any specific product or any specific market. What do Crypto.com, Spotify, and Silicon Studios all have in common? This man, Henrik Johansson. How are you doing today, Henrik? Very good, thank you. Could you take a couple of minutes just to introduce yourself, give our audience a little bit of perspective on what you're doing and what your current title is at Crypto.com? Sure, sure. sure. Um, so I'm a Swede, uh, I, <laughs> as you can tell by the name maybe. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in a small city in, in Sweden originally, uh, but uh, I came to Japan about 17 years ago. Um, and ever since I've been working in uh, different companies that uh, are trying to bring new technology to market, basically, whether it's uh, in the form of gaming or social networking or streaming or, uh, for example, now in, in the world of Web3. Um, I'm currently the global head of growth for Crypto.com, uh, and I also support our GameFi initiatives, uh, and I also support our VD initiatives. Nice. That's awesome. And so one of the topics that we were kind of talking about before we started rolling today um, was that concept of really entering new markets and this sort of conception that Japan is uh, like very unique and a very unique operating environment. And I actually think that you have a very interesting perspective on that, um, given some of your work history that we'll dive into in a little bit. Um, but yeah, do you wanna, what are, what are your thoughts there? Or, or do you have any advice maybe for companies that are gonna be entering into a new market? So uh, uh, yeah, so before I, I came to Japan, well, mm -hmm. we can talk about like the journey of coming to Japan and moving and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, but I also had the great privilege mm -hmm. uh, of uh, uh, working on the launch of Spotify in other markets, oh, like nice. in Brazil and Canada and oh, so I had on. No idea. Nice. Uh, and people think that you know, oh, Japan is so mm -hmm. it's so strange. Yeah. Yeah. Canada is like, it's a completely <laughs> different world as well. Uh, yeah. For, you know, in a very, very interesting uh, place, you know, you've got multiple languages, yeah. you know, the, the proximity to the U.S. is a huge thing, right? Yeah. Uh, even though it's a completely yeah. different form, of yeah. uh, form, but like a very different society, yeah. right? Drake uh, is there. Drake is there. <laughs> very uh, <prominent>. yeah. <laughs> This is true. Um, uh, and many of Celine Dion is also there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't know right. if he's there now, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, we come in with these yeah. assumptions that yeah. because there's, uh, for example, the majority of the it's population English speaks speaking, English, yeah. then it's like, oh, you know, we get it. Like, this yeah. is easy. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, yeah. right? Not by any stretch. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you kind of need to go through that journey a few mm -hmm. times before you realize that it doesn't matter if it's Japan mm -hmm. or Sweden or mm -hmm. Canada or there are a set of fundamental questions that you need to ask yourself uh, if you are going to be successful in sort of figuring out how to launch something, how to grow something, uh, how to establish something, um, which goes be, you know, beyond any specific product or any specific market. Um, That's great. What, um, what are those questions? Is that something that you can... Sure, yeah, sure, about. sure. Um, so, I think the first thing to recognize is that you think you know your product, right? Uh, whether it's a web service or uh, maybe it's a, a piece of hardware or whatever it is, maybe it's an application, <clears throat> you think you know it and you think it's the same. But every new culture or market that you bring this product into is going to view it in an entirely different way. Uh, they are going to see it differently, it's going to solve different problems for the users there. Uh, and the adoption pattern and the usage pattern is probably going to look very different. Uh, even between countries like, uh, you know, like we said earlier, Canada, United States, mm -hmm. they're close to proximity and so on. But the way people look at things and use things is, is very different. Uh, same thing with Japan, obviously. When we brought Spotify here, the use cases and the, the places where people would use the application or the value that they would see it is entirely different from the way people used it in, in Sweden and so on. And it's not just a matter of maturity, right? Because you can say, well, obviously, because uh, Sweden is the, the place where Spotify was born, right? It's been around for over a decade. Uh, people have gotten used to it. It's like paying your water, you know, or sewage bill, whatever. Uh, it's like, it's like a, just something that, that you do. Yeah, you have a utility. Um, but it's not just about that, right? It's obviously, maturity plays into it. But it's also when you see this adoption starting to take off, even at the very, very early stage, it comes from a different place. It's, it's viewed in a different manner. Um, on top of that, you also have this idea that when we launched in Sweden, it was at the height of piracy, right? Um, whereas when we launched in Japan, uh, obviously piracy had pretty much gone away from, from a lot of markets, right? And in, in Japan, it was never really that big to begin with. So the problem that it solves is different, not just because there's a different market, a different culture, a different audience, but also because it's a different time, oftentimes. Right? Uh, and I think those are, that kind of realization, first of all, step back and assume 
that you're bringing something into the market where you cannot count on a product market fit even though you think you know your product really well and you think it's going to be awesome obviously otherwise you wouldn't be <laughs> you didn't have the belief you wouldn't be you know uh, but start there right and then look at when you actually introduce this into this audience what happens you know how do they perceive it how do they use it because you can imagine that there are problems that this group of people want to solve right um, but it might not be at all what they actually do with your product right? it might fit a completely different use case or issue um, yeah, I totally, I totally understand what you're saying. I think um, with Spotify specifically, um, I remember talking to Mai, who we had just been talking about, um, and we, when I first came to the market in Japan, when I first moved here, and um, she was, it's like her KPI was basically completely different from what it was, or from what it would have been in the States, right? Where here it was like, at that time, it was literally like awareness. Mm. Like that was the biggest factor. Um, and just getting that, that market share and that mind share from some of the other big players that already exist in here. And that kind of carries on what you were talking about with time, mm. um, where like you were saying in, in Sweden, um, it, it's almost replaced that piracy factor. And here um, it was completely not about that, right? It was almost like, from my perspective, the value of Spotify was more like, that access to maybe music that people hadn't discovered yet. Um, whereas a platform like Line Music or Apple Music was maybe feeding them more of the same sort of artists that they were familiar with. Um, and so I do, I do totally see that it can be solving for a different issue depending on, on the market. Um, and so that's kind of that, that first fundamental question of um, do you even really have product market fit or, or what is the use case actually for this market that you're entering? Um, what's maybe another question that you should be asking yourself if you're looking at entering a, mar a market that you're not familiar with? I think uh, another one is, uh, that's very important is on the brand side mm -hmm. of things. Um, like what are you perceived as? Uh, because the product is one thing, right? And it's going to, uh, to some extent, sort of be your brand, uh, depending on how you weave that, that narrative and how you create that story. Um, but obviously, especially if you're coming in and you, maybe you, you think you have you know, excellent brand awareness or you think you have a huge brand sort of globally, but you bring that into a new market where people might never have heard of you before uh, and they have no clue what this brand actually means. They will look at your, your logos and your marks and everything in a very different way, right? Uh, so the, the second, or I don't know if it's the second, it's probably mm. completely parallel, but <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is what is this brand that you're building? Like, what is this the story that you're telling about who you are uh, and what you represent, which is, you know, obviously separate from products, but will have a huge impact on the audience that you're talking to, how they perceive you, how they describe you to their friends, and how you get that kind of growth, uh, the viral growth loop going. Um, so that's another question. And you shouldn't assume, this is my personal belief, but you shouldn't assume that uh, even though your, your logos and your marks and everything might be exactly the same as in other countries, uh, that they will mean the same, right? And that's okay. You have to have a certain openness to that, right? You have to, to accept that uh, people will associate you differently or maybe even place you in an entirely different category, uh, which is fine as long as, it's, uh, you know, as long as it still at the end kind of reaches that product market fit where it solves the right types of problems for, for your end users. That's super interesting. And um, have you encountered anything, like, I guess, similar to that with, with crypto.com? Um, I mean, that's a pretty, I, I, I'm very curious about uh, crypto in general in Japan, because it kind of has this, this interesting history with like the blockchain creator potentially being Japanese or a Bitcoin creator potentially being Japanese, but no one really knows. And, and so like bringing a brand like crypto.com to Japan, have you encountered anything that like, was maybe sort of surprising to you about the branding or around the product market fit? Or what has been maybe your experience so far around that? Well, uh, so first of all, uh, Crypto.com is not live in Japan. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. yeah. So this will, be, uh, this will be a future question. Oh, probably, great. Okay. Point. Yeah. Who knows? Awesome. Uh, yeah. But I think, uh, you know, thinking about crypto in general uh, in, in Japan as a market is a very interesting question because Japan has always had a very high acceptance for digital payments. Mm -hmm. This is where, you know, um, Payments via, via uh, your phone basically got started, right? Uh, not to kind of get into the technical terms of it, but uh, it's been sort of a, a very common use case here for, for a very long time, even you know, way before Apple introduced in-app in -app payments and so on. Um, so this idea that you're uh, performing a digital payment, for example, that money is something abstract that exists uh, perhaps not in, in physical form, uh, is not necessarily new to, to the market, right? And at the same time, 
there is a, a very interesting use case here, which is the whole world of gaming, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you look at people uh, attributing value or, or assigning value to virtual items. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a, a few um, years with DNA, for example, where I was working on the, the mm -hmm. avatar platform uh, for Mobile Gay Town, which I don't know how many people are still mm -hmm. using. Mm -hmm. There's probably a few people out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, it was this idea that you know, as a user of, of this social network, you have your avatar. Uh, this avatar lives and exists in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. um, you buy items for this mm -hmm. avatar, you dress them up, you give them backgrounds, and there were games built around this mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, <clears throat> entirely virtual. Yeah. Um, I've, but, never, I've never heard of this, actually. It's like, it is like the metaverse concept, essentially, but... Uh, in a way. <laughs> yeah, very similar. In a way, yeah. a very early one. Um, yeah. but, uh, but it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, the yeah, thing is, yeah. people perceive things and they attach value yes. to it somehow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these, these avatars, they started out as 2D GIFs, basically, or GIFs. Uh, then we converted them into, into 3D mm -hmm. graphics and gave them kind of more life. You know, we could animate mm -hmm. them differently and so on. But they were still very tiny. Mm -hmm. It was done on the feature phone basis before you, know, you had smartphones and so on. Uh, even so, you know, they, they became a representation, obviously, of self mm -hmm. for the people who were using the platform. Uh, folks invested a lot of money and time mm -hmm. into this and mm -hmm. attached value to it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so there is, in general, very, very high acceptance of that virtuality mm -hmm. uh, that I think makes Japan sort of uniquely placed to, to embrace something like crypto, embrace the metaverse in a, in a way that maybe there's a little bit more resistance in, in a few other markets mm -hmm. in the world. So I, I think Japan is actually placed to uh, to become a very strong mm -hmm. and uh, rapid adopter mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. crypto. In fact, uh, if you go back a few years, uh, there has already been sort of a strong footing for crypto in this market for some time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very excited to see actually where it goes mm -hmm. next. You think about something like NFTs, mm -hmm. right? This idea of digital scarcity mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. It's not new to the public here, not, not new to the audience here, mm -hmm. because it's existed in the world of gaming and so mm -hmm. on for a very long time. Yeah. It, so before this, I was talking to my friend who works in that space, and, and one of the things that he was the most excited about was gaming also. And so I do think, I, at this point, um, do you, does Crypto.com have a product offering around gaming, or is that kind of a future plan, maybe something specific for this one? I don't know how much you can talk about also <laughs> around that. Sure, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, for sure. Uh, so we have uh, something uh, that's, uh, that's called Chronos Play which okay. is uh, uh, an SDK that we're helping develop uh, mm -hmm. on top of the Chronos chain and nice. sort of assisting in, mm -hmm. and providing some, some uh, help there. Um, and this uh, SDK basically allows the game developers who are interested in, in uh, developing blockchain games mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to put a plugin inside of Unity mm -hmm. uh, and through that plugin interact with uh, a blockchain, uh, creating NFTs, uh, initiating transactions mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's on the tooling side of things, nice. uh, yeah, you know, yeah, supporting yeah. that yeah. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, with the, obviously with the ultimate goal of, of driving more and more adoption yeah. because uh, that's you know what we believe is, is, is great both for us as a company but also for the end users. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and uh, there are you know of course uh, other initiatives. Uh, we we have the, the great fortune of being involved in a lot of projects around the world where yes. games are being developed and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of it is obviously stuff that's still quite early and a little bit difficult to talk about. Yeah, I totally understand. I do I do appreciate that. I think that um, yeah, I didn't know about the Unity integration. That's amazing. That's like, that's huge. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, that ease of use and that convenience for developers is always like super valuable. So I think that's, that's awesome. That sounds great. Um, and one thing I noticed um, that you kind of touched on there with like being involved in these very global projects, um, it seems like from my perspective, from outside perspective, um, the, I don't, I think maybe like, motif or ethos of crypto.com is very global mm -hmm. like you have a very global focus everything that you do um, even in what i think could be interpreted as a very western focus with like ufc or formula one like those are those are actually like very global sports um, and so how does that kind of play into your role here in apac as the head of growth um, yeah, how, how did, how did, like, what, what is that like internally, I guess? Is that like a conversation you guys are actively having? Is that something, a focus for you? For sure. And I, I think it actually is a good um, representation of the ethos of, of crypto in general. Mm -hmm. right? This idea that it knows no borders uh, and it knows uh, no limitations from that point of view. Uh, we're a very distributed team, obviously, uh, with uh, co-workers and, and people all around the world. Um, the company was, uh, you know, got its sort of 
starting uh, here in the APAC region, uh, but is now obviously operating globally as well. Um, and I think one of the things that we are trying really hard to do on a, on a you know, very conscious level uh, is to build both a brand that has a global appeal and that excludes no one, um, and also try to bring products to market that uh, are not geared specifically for any region so much as being more sort of universal in nature. Uh, now, obviously, one of the strengths of, of uh, having an organization like ours is that we can localize, right? And we can look at, okay, there are special needs or uh, there are certain things or, or product uh, uh, features that work better in, in one region versus another, and we can emphasize those and we can work on developing those. Uh, but ultimately, that's also part of being a global player, right? Because if you, if you pull anything, everything down to the, the least common denominator, mm -hmm. it's not going to be great for anyone, right? <laughs> so rather, you build a, uh, an amazing foundation, and then you start localizing, and, and you start looking at what, what are the things in, you know, in Brazil versus, uh, versus say, Canada, mm -hmm. uh, or Sweden, for that matter, uh, or Japan, uh, that, that make the most sense for the audience there, that you want to emphasize, that you want to strengthen, that you want to focus more on. And the same thing goes for brand building, right? Um, you need to be able to tell the story of who you are, uh, and why you matter to people, uh, in a way that, that makes sense to them, regardless of where they are in the world. So same thing, like you, you build a strong foundation, but then you, you ask yourself, okay, but how can I communicate this foundation? How can I build on top of this uh, to make myself more relevant or explain my value better to, to users in, in, or customers in different parts of the world? So yeah, I think the short answer to your question is that it's a very strong um, undercurrent in everything that we do. Um, and I think also one of the sort of guiding principles when we think about going into new markets or looking to build you know, great relationships with regulators or, or whatever it can be, uh, is to make sure that we have that global perspective, mm -hmm. but that we are adapted to what makes the most sense and what is you know, uh, obviously <laughs> uh, compliant and so on uh, for each market that we operate in. That's great. And that actually kind of, kind of brings us back to uh, the beginning of this topic where you're talking about looking at global markets and how you can, um, like what questions you should be asking yourself um, for your product, for your company, um, before entering these markets. Um, and so the first question was around the product market fit, um, and really looking at the use cases, if they align with your previous use cases, if they need to be adopted uh, and then or adapted. And, um, and then the second was around branding uh, and the interpretation of branding in a new market. Is there any other questions that you'd want to go over around what you should be looking at before entering a market? I think also uh, another thing that's very uh, important to me is uh, you, you need to look at your internal culture as a company, right? Uh, because when you go into a new market and you, you're establishing a local entity, for example, or starting to build a team, then you will run into a bunch of very interesting, fascinating uh, problems or opportunities, challenges. depending, challenges, yeah. depending on your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because you, you have now, you know, in, especially if you've been around for a while, you've established kind of a culture within the company, you've built up an idea, sort of, sort of like a soft contract between how people work and the expectations they manage and so on. Uh, and now you're walking into a new culture and you will start hiring people who are uh, not only remote, far away from HQ, for example, um, but also maybe have a different working style or different expectations or a different communication style or, or, or so on. Uh, there's nothing you no know, inherently good or bad way of doing it, uh, for sure, but there are differences and those are important, I think, to, to manage as well. So when you are bringing a product into a new market and you're spinning up a team and you're establishing a, a team and so on, uh, I think you really have to ask yourself also, what are the pieces of that culture of, of your company, for example, or your team that you want to emphasize and retain? And how do you make it possible for people who come in, uh, in, in your local entity to bring in their culture as well and enrich what you're bringing from global, right? Uh, this is a, a question that is often overlooked. People think that it's just going to work itself out or you know, people would just figure it out. But I, in my experience, it's not that easy. Uh, you have to take uh, or, or make a very conscious effort to educate uh, people on this is our culture, this is how we do things, how we uh, communicate, how we set expectations, how we work, and so on. Uh, and then also have this openness to adapt to whatever the local culture is. Um, otherwise, you will, in, often, in many cases, you will end up in a situation where you have either a uh, local entity that's poorly connected to, to the local market, or you have a local entity that's poorly connected to HQ. In either case, it's obviously disastrous. <laughs> so uh, I think that's another one. And, and your, your end customers will feel this as well, uh, because they, they will feel when you have diverged too far from, or divert too far from, from uh, the kind of global brand or um, the, what they can maybe know about you as a, as a global uh, product, um, they will feel that and they will know that. And, and 
oftentimes that's not very positive. Um, now there are other cases where it kind of actually makes sense. <laughs> there, there are rare cases where um, a product will sort of outlive its global footprint in a specific market. Uh, there are some products in Japan, for example, that are still going strong even mm -hmm. though they they kind of failed in in their home markets. We were uh, Yahoo. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I think Yogibo is another interesting. <laughs> yeah, example. yeah, that's very true. <laughs> pretty, yeah. pretty recent. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you know that's a, that's a whole other question, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's a whole other scenario. No one wants that, right? You want to build a team that can enrich your global structure with their local perspectives uh, and at the same time be very well integrated with the, the global team that you're building. Yeah, that's super interesting that you mentioned that. I, I feel like um, I hear about these companies who become like people say that around Microsoft or Google, like it's become very domestic. Um, and you probably have one of the best perspectives on this or the most experience around this because um, you've worked at like Silicon Studios, DNA, which are Japanese companies, um, de de very, I'm assuming fairly domestic companies. And so kind of you have that experience of being someone who's not from Japan, not born in Japan and working in these very domestic companies, but then also these like in very international companies coming into Japan and building out that culture. Um, and so uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about that experience, what it was like working in maybe Silicon Studios and DNA, moving to Spotify and then moving to- Sure, DNA. sure, sure. Uh, and here it's interesting to look at the timeline as well, mm -hmm. right? Because when I joined Silicon Studios, this was, um, uh, in 2005, I think. <laughs> so it was 15, 16, 17 yes. years ago. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, obviously, like being a foreigner in Japan is a little bit different from, yeah. from what it's like today. Uh, I remember when I first arrived here, uh, which was earlier than that, of course, um, you know, just communicating with friends and family uh, back in Sweden was a lot harder than yeah. it is today. <laughs> uh, because we didn't have, you know, a lot of the tools that we do now. There were a few, like Skype was around, there were certain things you could do, but then again, getting internet access, to, which was, you know, stable and fast and so on, was not as easy either. So it was a, it was a di very different time, right? Uh, also very, very fun, because to be honest, I think there is, a, there is some value uh, in not, instead of sort of being cut off a little bit from your your, your familiar grounds uh, and kind of forces you to explore in a different way and so on. So on a personal note, I think it's, a, it's an extremely valuable experience. Can I pause you there for one second? I totally agree with that. It's not something I've ever talked to anyone about, so I want to sit on this for a second. Um, I feel like moving to another country, and I kind of experienced this a little bit. I moved to, to a couple times in the States, but moving to a different country, it was almost like I had to really look at like, who am I? Like, what do I value? What do I want to spend my time actually doing separate from my social circle or whatever that is? And so I do feel like that it's super interesting. I've never heard anyone else say that. So I, I totally agree. It's a very interesting topic yeah. because it's rare for people to get a chance to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that's not what you want to do, but because you get boiled down to just your core, uh, because you don't have, you, you can't see the reflection of your own self and the people around that. It gets very sort of social psychology and so on. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it does allow you to kind of decide what pieces of yourself that you want to reconstruct or that you want to rethink and so on. Um, so it's a unique opportunity. I think a lot of people will probably benefit from, from having it at some point. I totally uh, agree. Come to I, Japan. And, <laughs> no, no, and, and I think it's a bit harder today maybe because today we are so much more connected, right? Yeah. When you arrive in a new country, you'll start posting pictures on Instagram or other you know, social networks uh, immediately. Yeah. And so you're, you're still sort of connected. But back then yeah. we didn't have those tools. I actually, I created a small newsletter uh, <clears throat> about you know, being in Japan uh, and I had an audience, you know, that I would send, but I had no clue who these people were. <laughs> because you, you, know, you, you didn't have a community around it, it was just a little, yeah. little newsletter. Um, but anyway, so... It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I think at that point also the, the company that I joined, you know, they, there was actually, I think there was one other foreigner at the time who worked there. Mm -hmm. um, and Which company was this? Silicon Studio. Okay, okay. yes, yeah, yes, yeah. okay. Uh, so there wasn't this kind of, um, they weren't used to having foreigners mm -hmm. working in that environment either, uh, which I think was a, 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 a huge strength for both sides, right? Because uh, it taught me so much about working in, in, in a Japanese company, mm -hmm. and I think it, it gave them a lot of perspectives on dealing with this weird person as well. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I think also at the same time, it's important to remember that you are, you are a minority, uh, and you're working into, walking into an environment that has very different expectations and perhaps a, a completely different way of doing things. And uh, you should not expect them to adapt to how, you know, to your way of thinking, at least not immediately. Over time, hopefully you can bring some of that value. Uh, but uh, I think it, 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 
instills in you a certain humbleness because you kind of have to just step back and go, okay, oh, wow, this is another way of doing it. That's very interesting. And you learn from that, like you grow from that. Um, so there was that. And then, you know, a few years later, um, after, you know, passing through Silicon Graphics and then coming to DNA, um, it was a kind of a different world, right? Uh, at, the, you know, around 2008, 9, 10, 11. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think at that point, many Japanese companies who were in the IT sector had started looking at their counterparts in Silicon Valley and so on, uh, and they were starting to import ideas, kind of thinking about, okay, what, what are the good pieces we can bring into our culture um, from other places around the world? Uh, and so there was a, a, a much higher willingness to kind of experiment and, and bring some of those perspectives in. Um, still, you know, obviously, I actually don't remember if there were any of the foreigners and the, <laughs> there were four foreigners in the company obviously but probably not around the the area where i was uh, working which is on the the mobile side of things the avatar business and so on um and then you know obviously the with that or, or during that time as as uh, the smartphones started to to proliferate then uh came to japan as well um social gaming became a huge thing right um and i kind of drifted more into game development and there i think Japan has always been at the forefront of, you know, telling stories through video games uh, and sort of video games as an art form and so on. And so there, uh, it was a completely different atmosphere, right? When you when you're kind of in the world of gaming, because suddenly you're not that foreign company, you know, that, that no one has heard of in Japan, but suddenly you're part of a of a global industry and a global community that looks up to, to everything that, that is done in Japan, right? Uh, so completely different. It's like the flip almost. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, I wouldn't yeah. say that people that ever had like a, a negative impression mm -hmm. of, of, you know, Japan, places like Japan, DNA or Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's a great company. And, yeah. and, uh, and uh, I think um, even actually back then, like mm -hmm. there, were, there were a lot of people in North America who mm -hmm. saw what DNA was doing and mm -hmm. kind of interested in. Uh, but it was more neutral, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't have that kind of cultural um, equity, I guess, that the gaming has. Yeah, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was very different. And then, you know, going to, to, to San Francisco and, and working there for a while, but being part of a Japanese company, that's a whole other experience. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's super interesting. <laughs> it's very yeah. interesting. Because yeah. uh, then, you know, you have a person who was born and raised in Sweden, uh, working in a Japanese company. And at that time, I had been working for Japanese companies for quite some time. So I was pretty, probably pretty Japanese in my work <laughs> style, you know. Uh, but representing that entity yeah. in a startup in San Francisco, yeah. Uh, which had a completely different, you know, ways of, of yeah. thinking. Um, so it was a very, a very interesting journey of kind of going through mm -hmm. all these different cultures. Mm -hmm. And I think the the key thing for me, the the takeaway from all of this is that um, great things are born out of these organizations when they figure out what their culture is, right? Uh, and and I, I keep coming back to this, but you know, this mixture of having a corporate culture, which sounds kind of boring, but it's actually really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have this kind of corporate culture, and then that gets infused with the perspectives and thoughts and, and experiences of people from all over the world, right? Uh, when you find a balance there, something that utilizes that strength and still manages to stay connected to and, and leaning into the strengths of having a global organization, that's when really great things happen, right? Um, but I think it's difficult. It's, it's, uh, it, it takes... Um, it takes a lot of humbleness. Uh, I think everyone kind of has to be prepared to take a step back and just look at the look at the team, look at the culture, look at what you're trying to achieve, um, and stay really focused on, on those goals rather than you know what sort of entity you belong to or what part of the organization you work for and so on. Um, I think that's a that's a it's easier to develop that sensibility when you've been thrown into many different <laughs> cultures and you know you've been in many different environments. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so yeah, it's a, uh, and then obviously after that, going back to Sweden, which is a very interesting experience, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're born in Sweden uh, and you're of Swedish nationality and so on. But I, and we can talk about my early days, you know, of running a company in Sweden and so on. But um, I spent, I, I grew up mostly from a professional point of view in Japan uh, and some time in North America, right? So now you're coming back to Sweden you walk into a bank and you have no clue what to do, right? Because I, I, got, <laughs> I got married in Japan. I, I, you know, my daughter was born here. I bought my house here. I took my driver's license here. And so you're walking to a, a bank in Sweden and they just expect you to know everything, right? You look Swedish, you speak the language. I have no clue what to do. <laughs> so, so you're a foreigner in your own culture again. Um, and that's such an important perspective, right? Because suddenly you look at the co-workers you have who moved into Sweden from other countries, right? And I'm not going to pretend that I understand what their, what, you know, what their experience is like, but at least you can start to, you know, have some empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, you've, you've seen the stares and you've, you've gotten the looks and it's like, 
again, obviously very different from a person who is not born in Sweden, but um, I just think it's there, there's something there about how you, you kind of lose your nationality and you lose that kind of, uh, the part of you that's tied to specific geography and instead you're just a person with certain beliefs and you have kind of your own microculture that you bring with you regardless of where you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. I, I think it's like, um, I mean, you highlighted it there. Like there's not a lot of people I think who have had that experience um, where you, uh, you've you been through several markets, um, very global perspective. But I think one thing that, that, you, that you did a good job of sort of elucidating, I guess, from your experience is that, that almost that, um, that minority perspective that you, you talked about at the beginning where in every market, it was about kind of humbling yourself and looking at, okay, what are the elements that are important from the corporate culture? What are the elements that are, that are valuable in this local culture? And, and where is that balance? Um, and being able to kind of take that minority perspective and empathize with both sides, um, I think is something that is super important and probably not a lot of people consider when they're even launching something in a new market or, or it's probably not top of mind at least. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that that's super unique, and um, I think that with this new position uh, at, at Crypto.com, I think that that's something that you're going to bring to to each market that you guys are, are potentially launching in um, in the near future. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so kind of following on those questions um, that we had started off with. Um, so, product market fit, uh, marketing, branding, com uh, company culture and how, how that adapts to the local culture. Um, any other questions that you feel like, I, I don't know, I don't know the number, I don't know if you have a number, I don't even know if maybe you've outlined these like, in your own time, but if there is anything else that you'd want to talk about that, that just people you feel like companies should be aware of if they are looking at a new market. Yeah, any, anything else that, that comes to mind? I think uh, another thing that's, uh, that's very uh, important is to look at uh, how do you, how do you empower uh, people that uh, are remote from from where you you know from HQ for example or from your vantage point or and that could be you know it doesn't matter actually it's an interesting perspective right because if you're sitting in a, in a satellite office that's on the other side of the world from HQ your team is a, a size of five versus you know thousands of people in, in HQ you can still ask yourself how can I empower people in HQ to understand me better and so on right so uh, I think that question of of empowerment uh, is also extremely important. It's a little bit different from culture, right? Uh, because here it comes down to more, how do you set this team up for success so that they can operate uh, autonomously, that they can take ownership, uh, and that they can feel that they have control over uh, their own prioritizations, their own destiny, and so on, while obviously, you know, keeping it close to, to the overall uh, priorities of, of your organization. Um, so how do you create that, right? Um, and I think it comes down to a few things. One is that you have to be very careful with, with leadership because leadership has a, an outsized impact on culture in the beginning of a new team building exercise, right? Uh, the people who, who, who start to create that, that sort of microculture of a particular team, for example, or, or a remote office and so on, uh, they will have an, an outsized impact, especially in the beginning. Uh, so finding the right leaders is, is extremely important. Um, but then you also need to, uh, at least this is my experience, you kind of have to let go a little bit and you have to accept a certain higher level of variance because you will not be able to influence this group as much as you may be doing with someone who's sitting in the same building or uh, a team that's very close to you physically uh, or geog geographically. So that's another really important one, right? So how do you empower this team by putting the right leadership in place and then setting your own expectations where you allow for a higher degree of variance because they will figure out ways of doing things that you hadn't thought about, right? Uh, it's not really a culture thing. It's more about uh, setting context, making sure people understand what's important, uh, and giving them the tools to be able to make decisions on their own, right? Because uh, if you don't, and I think many of many of people who've done the kind of journey that I have probably been in a situation right, where you, before you kind of realize this, you work 24-7 because there's always someone awake in some time zone somewhere, and you, you feel like, oh, you got to check in, you got to give them more content, you got to like explain things, help them prioritize. Like, that's not going to work. You have to be able to take a step back and say, I've given you all the tools, now you figure this out. And it's not going to be exactly how I expected it, but it's going to be good <laughs> because I trust you, right? Uh, so how do you create that empowerment and that, that autonomy? That's another thing that you need to think carefully about when, when you're establishing a new entity or when you're entering a new market and so on. Um, yeah, I love that. I think, um, I think that that ties into, I, I've talked about this 
on the on the show before. Um, but my experience also as like a manager, um, where I my I, it's funny because I think I've said this exact thing, but um, I think a lot of times before you manage people in general, you kind of see it as what you described at the beginning or, or what you described in the middle there, kind of, of being like especially if it's across time zones, um, of being like, oh, I have to be there. I have to like almost physically, like if it can't be physically, digitally, like, I have to be available to put out any fires and beyond put out any fires, make sure fires don't even happen. Like, like you have to be there for everything. Um, and I think that that's a big, big misstep for a few reasons. And, and one of the things that you highlighted there is just like that lack of trust um, and that, that inability to accept that variance that does come with enabling your team to kind of make their own decisions. And so I think that that's a big lesson. Like you put it in the context and kind of through the frame of, of having remote teams and being disconnected. But I think that's, a, that's an important lesson across maybe any, any job ever. Um, and so I, I do really appreciate that. And I think that, that that's something that, that everyone should definitely keep in mind. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask around that is how that kind of has come into play with you building out maybe these teams now, working with Crypto.com, being in Japan, um, working with a global team, San Francisco, APAC. Um, how has that kind of factored into, into your role now? So I, I think uh, it's uh, not too dissimilar from, from, from that point of view, it's not too dissimilar from, from uh, the work I did at, at Spotify as well, when I was still based in, in uh, Tokyo, but running all the global growth uh, stuff. Um, I, I think it's very important that you always come back to context, right? Uh, that you always set, you're kind of a, you're a stage uh, manager, basically, right? You have to, to create this, this fantastic stage that has all the props and all the things that people need to be able to, to make their own decisions and actually uh, uh, manage their own work, right? Uh, if you don't set that context, you don't give people the right uh, sort of sense of macro and so on, then you won't be able to trust that they'll make the right decisions, right? Uh, so, for example, I spend a lot of time with my teams talking about the longer picture, you know, the, or the longer term picture, uh, the bigger picture, the macro, the context. Like, why are we doing this? Like, what's important to us? If we think three to five years out, like, what do we think will be most important to us? Uh, because you need those sort of goalposts a little bit further out so people know which direction to go, right? Uh, how they get there will look a little bit different depending on where in the world they are uh, or you know, the circumstances of their markets, uh, how often you're able to check in and so on. Um, but I think the way it, it kind of colors my work is that I spend a lot less time in the details and a lot more time just sort of talking about, okay, this, this is the general direction and this is why it matters, you know. Uh, this is why, not to us as a company, oh, well, that's important too, but also why does it matter to our end customers, right? Mm -hmm. What's important to them? And if we have an, a, an overall alignment on that and we know where we're headed and what we believe is important, then you know you'll be able to make a lot of decisions on on your own. You don't actually need to check in with me all the time. Uh, and I think that's an interesting uh, trap here, right? Because the soon uh, the minute you start to micromanage or you want to be part of every single decision made, uh, you are actually not you're not sort of staying at a neutral level. You're creating a downward spiral where people get less and less secure, and they feel like they have to check in with you with every single thing, right? Uh, which will you know over sort of, um, uh, it will overwhelm you um, and it will make them a lot less efficient. And as an organization, you just end up being, you know, weaker and weaker because of it. Um, delegation stops functioning, basically. Uh, so for me, uh, it's not that different. I, I, I spent a lot of time doing, doing the same at, at Spotify, basically trying to set that context, right? And giving people the, the right level of information, uh, repeating the same thing over and over again. Uh, not because people don't understand, but because they have a million other things to think about. So they need that reminder constantly, right? Uh, and so do I, right? I mean, I appreciate my own sort of managers doing the same thing with me, right? Uh, but I, I think that's, that's critical because when you're, when you're not remote or when you're sort of sitting together, uh, say, in the same building, same floor, same space, um, then you're naturally more involved in a lot of this decision making, right? Uh, it's not necessarily micromanagement. It's more just a matter of overhearing conversations, uh, sitting in the same meetings, uh, working closely to each other, spotting something on a screen like you're not because you feel like you need to, but this kind of just happens naturally. Right? Um, so one the sort of one of the guiding principles for me is that long term, I want to be surprised, you know, uh, constantly by great stuff that's happening in the team. Uh, because that means that they're not reliant on me for every single decision. They have the right context, they're working on the right things, and they're prioritizing the right things. Uh, and 
when it happens, it's a, it's a delightful surprise to everyone, right? Now, uh, no, obviously, it's a journey, right? In the beginning, you'll have less delightful surprises as well. But, <laughs> uh, but to me, that, that's, that's very, very important. Um, I also think people, you know, when you're in a remote location, it's something that's very important for people in HQ and, uh, to understand as well. So when you're in a remote location, you don't have any of that natural uh, context or contact that, that folks in a, in a much bigger office location, for example, might have, right? Uh, and so I think in remote locations, teams tend to gel together, not so much based on the function that they have, but because they're part of the same organization, right, overall. Uh, and that, that's great because obviously it creates a lot of cross-functional collaboration and so it's really, really good. But if you're not giving your local folks the right level of context, uh, and each function locally only sees one piece of the, of the puzzle, right, uh, then they won't be able to collaborate, which means that as a, as a function that's remote and has like a, a, a lower sort of frequency of communication mm -hmm. um, with HQ, they'll be a lot less effective. Right? Um, so I think overall, like that's, that's absolutely critical to, to help people grow, to, to make work exciting and interesting to them, especially in a sort of HQ and remote location working together. Yeah, it's so, yeah, it's, it's a struggle. I think that, I mean, we're even facing here right now. Um, yeah, talking about kind of being located at HQ, obviously we're, we're based in Japan, operating in Japan. All of our team is here, but we're fully remote now. And, um, and I, I've kind of noticed that change um, where it almost felt like before when we were in the office, it was almost like mission through osmosis. Like everyone kind of understood, we we're all aligned, where we were headed, uh, what the goals were, really gelling as a team. Uh, and then when we all moved remote, it it became harder to really find that common like connective tissue mm -hmm. that we could all rally behind. Yeah. And and what I wanted to ask was, I mean, you mentioned some of maybe the the less exciting surprises that you've, if you could share any experiences or things that you've kind of used, like you mentioned like over communication and being able to really kind of express the context uh, in a way that, that everyone can align on uh, and giving people that freedom. Um, yeah, any anecdotes? So this is an, <laughs> okay, it's not really an anecdote, it's more, more kind of a, an approach that I think Great. is, is okay. important, which is uh, oftentimes, so we're in kind of this brand new world where remoteness is a norm and not an exception. Even if you're in the same country or even living in the same city as your coworkers, you might not have an office to go to and so on. And I think a very common mistake that people still make is that they are trying to replicate the way we worked when we were in the same room, but doing it remotely, right? Uh, so they're still setting up meetings the same way. They're still managing the calendars the same way. Uh, they're still trying to run you know, uh, meetings and agendas and share priorities the same way uh, without recognizing that Remoteness comes with its challenges, right? But it also has a lot of opportunities. There's now a completely different level of asynchronicity between teams. Uh, there's now a completely different way that, that you can share information because it doesn't have to be face-to-face -face anymore uh, and so on. So I think the teams that are successful in this transition are the ones that are not trying to replicate what we did before, but instead are asking themselves, okay, if we were to start from zero now and think about how do we disseminate the information? How do we prioritize together? How do we do these exercises with the tools and the technology that we have it, uh, available to us? Those are the teams, I think, that are, are most successful in this, in this environment and so on. Um, and obviously, you know, this, has, this, uh, this past two, three years now with, with COVID um, have kind of spawned a whole new in industry around creating mm -hmm. tools for this, right? So there's a lot of stuff out there that that we didn't have before this situation happened because there wasn't a big enough audience for it, right? Um, I know, for example, there's some very interesting tools that allow you to run meetings asynchronously. Basically, you, you start, you, you basically record audio as part of a meeting invite and you have this kind of asynchronous audio recording conversation with uh, people joining the meeting before it even starts, right? And so when the calendar rolls around, it's time to get together, everything's already decided. Like these kinds of, it's almost yeah. like answering machine communication. Yeah, 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 that's beautiful, uh, yeah. Uh, but there are these amazing tools, right, that you can lean into. Um, and it does require you to think a little bit different. And it's a little bit scary probably, to, especially to organizations that have, you know, one set way of working. Um, but once you embrace it, it, it can be incredibly empowering. I think. That's awesome. Um, that's super interesting. I, I actually, I hadn't heard of that. That sounds great. And I think even having that perspective of starting from zero now, 
is super important. I think that it's not something that internally that I've been part of those discussions, but I think that that's that, yeah, that's the perspective. Like just hearing you say that gave me a, a lot of, I think, room to think now, like, which is, I had some, not something I'd really considered. I think also because, uh, you know, when you're in a, in a tech startup, in a FinTech startup, uh, you're attracting a lot of young talent, right? Uh, and these people have different expectations and they're, they're not used to, I, you know, in my first, first real job, I was, uh, what was my first real job actually? <laughs> One of my very early jobs uh, was, to, was as a teacher, you know, I was teaching, um, sorry, I was teaching um, hypermedia and game studies and game development principles uh, at a university in Sweden. Uh, and we used to send letters around in little like brown envelopes, right, that, that you would write the name of the person, the, the faculty, the person that you're sending it to, and you put it in a box, and in the afternoon it would arrive, right? Uh, there was email, but a lot of people weren't using it, right? Uh, that's obviously very different from the expectation of a person who, who comes into a workplace today, right? Yeah. So I think uh, if you want to attract and retain and empower that kind of talent, then again, it becomes really important to step away from some of these ingrained ways of working. And when I say ingrained, I mean, we have to remember it's only a couple of years ago. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> we're not talking about, well, in Japan, maybe, but we're not talking about fax machines, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more, I think, this expectation of, yeah. of when when and how, how you work. Right? And now, I think we see here in Japan, for example, a lot of interesting experiments with four-day work weeks and so on. There's, a, there's a, an entirely different willingness to, to experiment um, because you, know, you see, the, you see the, the changing expectations of the talents that you're trying to attract and retain. Um, so I, I think it's very exciting, actually. Uh, uh, you know, having been sort of digitally native since my childhood, I, for me, it's, 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 it's kind of like finally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Um, it's yeah, it's interesting. Like, on that, on that topic, um, when we so this is Yuika, who's a member of our team, um, she does a lot of our Japanese content. Um, she we were talking to her, and she was like, "I've literally never had an in-person interview," mm -hmm. and I was like, "That's so surreal to me because that's like everything that we, especially at a recruitment company, like we even there's there's candidates who we've helped find jobs." Mm -hmm that the consultants have never even met in person. And it's like two years ago, like you were saying, like that was completely unheard of. Like it was like you meet everybody, you really try to develop these relationships. And so seeing how much it's changed has been, yeah, really interesting. And I, I do think it is exciting even with, um, like in a market that has a reputation for being slow moving, like Japan in terms of work culture changes and being behind the times in that way, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of like willingness to experiment. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also actually think that uh, on that note, you know, it's a it's a bit of an unfair um, <laughs> uh, not assessment, mm -hmm. but like uh, maybe public image mm -hmm. uh, of you know work life in Japan, like work life balance being terrible mm -hmm. and and so on. Uh, obviously, there's uh, there are environments where that's true, um, but in my experience, I think there's there's a, there's a combination of um, some traditional work environments that have that kind of that, that problem, if you will. Um, but other times, it's also just about people being extremely ambitious mm -hmm. and, and having this enormous you know, energy and willingness to, to put in the work to make things happen, right? Uh, working at, at, uh, at DNA, for example, like, there were a lot of, of long nights and you know, that kind of stuff, but it was also an incredible energy, mm -hmm. like willingness to change something, to build something amazing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which I think, and, and with a society that, uh, or an environment that supports that a lot better. Because if you're in Sweden, right, uh, and you work overtime and it's 10 p.m., you, can, you basically can't find food, right? Mm. The, everything's closed. The stores are closed. Restaurants are closed. Like, there's, no, there's nothing you can do there. Whereas in, in Japan, if it's 4 a.m., you, yeah, you can basically shift your hours around and still live a normal yeah, life yeah, in yeah, this yeah, market, yeah. right? Uh, and so... I think there's a combination of that, right, and this this incredible willingness to just make something happen um, that creates an image of people working 24/7. Um, but it it can actually be an in incredible environment to be in, right, because uh, it's got so much energy. Um, I don't think it's unique to Japan. I don't think yeah. it's unique to to, to DNA either. Um, I think it's a startup thing, right? Yeah. That that um, is just very exciting. Yeah, it's interesting that you said. It's something that I've noticed is like. You'll see those like I don't I don't want to throw like Vice Media or something under the bus, but you see those like stories. I don't even know if it was Vice or Vox, whatever those, those like some of those stories. It's like like 
businessmen in Japan like sleeping on the streets or whatever. And it's painted in this really kind of negative light. And then you'll see stories about like, like Masahiro Sakurai like didn't sleep or like slept in the office for like four months to make Smash Brothers happen. Uh, and it's like painted in like almost the opposite light. It's like this amazing, like you were saying, it's like this amazing energy. And so I think that it is really that context and kind of um, it, it's, yeah, it, I obviously, like you said, there are some environments where maybe the pressure is unfair, yeah. but I do think that, um, that yeah, it, it, a lot of it will come down to maybe the individual and their willingness mm. to believe in whatever they're working on. Mm. Um, one thing I do legitimately want to ask you, like not, I don't know if this is something you want to talk about on camera or not, um, but uh, so you, you were teaching game design before. Mm. It sounded like maybe, was that initially what brought you to Japan? No. Uh, so I think what originally brought me to, to Japan mm -hmm. um, was a couple of things actually that kind of lined up beautifully in time. Uh, I'd always had this deep fascination with, with uh, Japan as a culture and as a market, probably born out of my fascination with, with technology in general. Mm -hmm. Because when I was a kid, like you'd see all these boxes and all these pieces of hardware and it would say, you know, made in Japan mm -hmm. or it was shipped from Japan. And you're like, what is this magical place where all these amazing things are being built, right? Uh, and then, uh, as I, was, uh, as I was about to graduate from, from university, I actually come from a background in social psychology and media studies. Um, but when I was about to graduate, uh, I was asked if I would uh, stay, stay with the university for a while and start teaching um, this sort of combination of media studies and, and computer game design, um, because that's also part of my, my background. Um, and so I spent uh, a few years at, at the uh, university in Sweden basically teaching uh, me media studies through the lens of game design and computer games as interactive entertainment, uh, looking at storytelling and how to create narratives, uh, how to create interesting characters, uh, and how to kind of uh, look at how computer gaming as an art form and as a, an entertainment form was influencing uh, people's expectations of society and how sort of th those things connect. <laughs> so it's very academic, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, at the same time, because I had this sort of dual background in in uh, sort of being a self-taught programmer and computer science uh, and this idea of uh, social science, social studies. Um, I was actually working at a virtual reality center helping researchers turn their research data into uh, visualizations in virtual reality. <laughs> it's, it sounds, sounds really weird, but this it's was... Cool. You know, <laughs> I imagine uh, like Iron Man and like... Uh, Man. Not really. I mean, this, <laughs> this is late 90s, like <laughs> early 2000s. So we had these huge you know, silicon mm -hmm. graphics uh, mm -hmm. supercomputers mm -hmm. that we were, were programming and, and putting all this data into. But then we would invite people from the, the local city and, and you know, uh, folks who were kind of uh, part of these research studies to actually come and, and see the results of this research in virtual reality and kind of uh, explore it that way. Um, and as part of that, uh, I got very fascinated with, with this idea of how virtual uh, environments and real environments kind of overlap and how our expectations and our understanding of real world, sort of you know, the, the physical world, translates into the virtual. Uh, and as part of that, I started looking again at Japan because the concepts of time and space uh, are obviously very abstract, mm -hmm. right? But they're very different in Japanese culture and society versus, for example, the Nordics or, or Northern Europe. Um, and it kind of grew on me like this, this fascination that I kind of need to go to Japan and experience this because here, uh, you know, public spaces, uh, cities, living spaces, everything is, is built and, and constructed with entirely different models in mind. Uh, and that should, in turn, uh, create an entirely different virtuality as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of my, my entry. I came to yeah. Japan originally just to kind of experience and see all this and then look at how I can kind of bring them back into the work that I was doing in Sweden. And I ended up staying because, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> Japan. Yeah, yeah exactly. Every, that's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a trap. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And so from there, what, what was your first job in Japan, actually? Was it with Silicon Studios? Yes. OK. Um, so that was, well, actually, <laughs> yeah. there were, I had actually a, a, sh a short uh, uh, thing before that. I was uh, taking care of part of the, the IT infrastructure for a uh, design gallery in Harajuku uh, for a oh, while, cool. which is yes. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also a very long time ago. Um, but yeah, my, then I, I, I joined Silicon Studios as, a, as an engineer, as a programmer, uh, because I had that kind of self-taught background. Um, and ended up doing a lot of actually software architecture there, um, working with, because at the time, this was before Silicon Studios became more associated with gaming. Gaming, that's yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it was still very much about uh, you know, uh, audio video installations and that kind of stuff. And we were kind of building a, a new unit around, um, around software development as a service, basically. Uh, so 
it was a you know very exciting time. It was just around the time when Windows Vista was released, and you know .NET started to be really become a thing, and so on. So from a from a technical point of view, it was a very exciting time as well. I appreciate that perspective. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, Henrik. Um, yeah, anything, any last thoughts, anything else you want to touch on? Like maybe just going over uh, like something you want to promote for crypto.com? <laughs> anything, yeah, anything that you want to shout out now? Like, please. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I won't do that because okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it, that, that's a sensitive topic. Yeah. And, you know, obviously yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of crypto.com's mm -hmm. journey. It's, a, it's an amazing environment, mm -hmm. amazing company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, you know at the forefront, I think, of, uh, of one of those big tectonic shifts that, totally that mm -hmm. we will eventually look back at and say, mm -hmm. "Wow, you know, that was amazing." Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe the last thing I, I would say is that sort of coming back actually to the more general topic of just Japan mm -hmm. and yeah. the rest of the world is that Japan is also an, an, an amazing opportunity. You know, it's a fantastic market. Uh, it's got huge potential for. Uh, the next sort of iteration of digitalization and so on. There's a, there's a young uh, and incredibly energetic uh, audience here that is just looking for solutions to different types of problems. And um, obviously, I think crypto and Web3 will be one of those solutions, but uh, there's an opportunity for many, many other technologies also, I think, to, to, to enter this market. Um, and now with sort of, <laughs> okay, I shouldn't say this because it's a bit dangerous, but now hopefully with COVID kind of winding down a little bit, I think it, it opens up <laughs> yeah. even more of those. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Uh, um, but I, I think uh, it's just such an amazing place to be and, 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 and to operate in. Uh, but that said, you know, uh, for anyone who's thinking of entering this market or, or anyone who's thinking about establishing an entity here, um, recognize these questions about culture, right? Recognize these questions about finding the, the right and the strong leaders that you want to, uh, to put in place to build your team here uh, and invest in them, empower them, uh, and make sure that you look at what makes sense in this kind of brave new remote world. Right? Uh, if you take these things into account, I think it's a, it's a vast opportunity, and I think any, any company, any product can be incredibly successful here. That's great, perfect. Thank you so much, Henrik.